We have defined the trig functions, we have looked at some of their properties, and we have graphed them. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to look at the inverse trig functions. So we're going to introduce only three of the inverse trig functions, sine inverse, cosine inverse, and tangent inverse. So to be able to understand inverses and where they come from, I'm going to do a small algebra review in case you haven't done inverses in a while. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to begin with a function that most people feel pretty comfortable with, which is the parabola f of x is equal to x squared. So when we graph this parabola, it's an upwards opening parabola. And I'm going to pick some points. So negative 2 would be 4, negative 1 would be 1, 0, 0, 1 would be 1, and 2 would be 4. So what happens when we introduce the inverse is that we switch the input and the output. So the y becomes the x and the x becomes the y. So when we input 4, we output negative 2. So let's change our table. So now the x's would be 4, 1, 0, 1, 4. And our outputs would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And so if we graph these points, our x's 1, 2, 3, 4, our y's 1, 2, 1, 2. So we would have 4, negative 2. We would have 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. And so when I put this together, something really bad happens because this fails the vertical line test. It fails the vertical line test everywhere except at 0, 0. So when I draw a vertical line, it's going to touch the parabola twice. And so when a graph fails the vertical line test, it's not a function. And so that's bad because we need our inverse to be a function. If our original is a function, the inverse needs to be a function. So the way that we do this and, and the reason for this is because what happens is when we switch the x's and the y's, there was... Oop, that's not what I meant to do. There was a y, and actually multiple, but I'm going to use 4 as an example. There's a y that showed up twice. So when we switch the x and the y, there's an x that's going to show up twice. So what that means is that if your original function fails the horizontal line test, so if there are two of the same y's, then your inverse will fail the vertical line test. So what we need to do to create an inverse for that not to happen is that, so what do we do? What do we do? We restrict the domain. So we're going to make the function pass the horizontal line test. So for a function to have an inverse, It needs to pass the horizontal line test. And if it does, we say the function is 1, 2, 1. And it goes, this arrow goes both direction. Horizontal line test means that it's 1 to 1. If it's 1 to 1, it's going to pass the horizontal line test. It's just that horizontal line test is going to be the visual test of being 1 to 1. What that means is that every x and y is unique. It, every x is going to be unique because it's a function. And every y is going to be unique because it's going to be 1 to 1. So how do we do this? Well, if there is no set restriction, so I'm going to draw x squared again. So remember that for a function to have an inverse, y is equal to x squared. If we were to create the inverse, we will switch the x's and the y's. So it would become x is equal to y squared, which would mean that y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x. And this is where the issue comes in, the plus and minus. So actually f of x equals x squared has two possible restrictions. Either you could do this one. This would definitely pass the horizontal line test. So one, you could create the restriction from zero to infinity. That means that your inverse would be the positive square root of x. Or you could create your restriction to be on the left side. This would also pass the horizontal line test. And so that would be negative infinity to zero. And that would make your inverse the negative of the square root of x.
Now, luckily for us, we actually have a set restrictions for our inverse trig functions for us to have an inverse. So we don't need to decide which one it's going to be. It's set. It doesn't change. So let's take a look first at sine inverse. So we have y equals sine of x. I have the graph right there on the right. And we can pretty easily see that it fails the horizontal line test pretty miserably. And that makes sense because we're going to keep going around the circle. And we're going to keep outputting the same ratio. So the restriction that we create for, the, for sine to have an inverse is we actually take it from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now what needs to be important here is that the range has to stay the same. So it has to be negative 1 to 1 when you create your restriction. So the original domain of sine is all real numbers. So you can input any angle into sine and it will output a ratio. The range is negative 1. For sine to have an inverse, we create the restriction from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now, we need to do close brackets because it needs to include the axis angles, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, so that it includes the output negative 1 to 1. Now, you only use the restriction of the domain to create the inverse. So anytime you are evaluating original sine, you do not think about the restriction, only when you're evaluating sine inverse. So because the output and the, out and the input changes, they swap, what that means is that the domain and the range changes. So the domain is now negative 1 to 1, and the range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So what's really important here is what are you inputting and what are you outputting? So if we write our two functions, so in the original sign, you're inputting an angle and you're outputting a ratio. But when you do sine inverse, you're inputting a ratio and you're outputting an angle. And when you are starting to evaluate the inverse, you really want to keep writing this, and you're going to see that when I do that in the next video. So more specifically, the angle will have to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 when you answer it in between that in in interval because that's how you created the restriction of the domain. So visually, if I do a little visual here of the unit circle, here's 0, here's pi over 2. Actually, I'm going to put it right over it. Oh, I lost my G. It's okay. Here's pi. This is 3 pi over 2. But 3 pi over 2 is also negative pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 is counterclockwise. Negative pi over 2 is clockwise. So when we look at the restriction, your answer is going to land in here, in quadrants 1 and quadrants 4, or at the axis angles. So what are the angles we're going to see here? Well, this is pi over 6, this is pi over 4, and this is pi over 3. And in quadrant 4, this is 11 pi over 6, but we don't want to write it, you don't want to answer 11 pi over 6, because that's not between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. You need to answer the clockwise version of it, which would be negative pi over 6. This little angle right here is 7 pi over 4 but you want the negative pi over 4 version. And this angle right here is 5 pi over 3, but you're going to answer the negative pi over 3. So you want the clockwise version of quadrant 4 angles. You don't want the counterclockwise version. So when you evaluate a sine inverse, your answer is either going to be negative pi over 2, negative pi over 3, negative pi over 4, negative pi over 6, 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, or pi over 2. Those are your only options when you answer a sine inverse. Let's look at cosine. So the original domain of cosine is all real numbers. The range is negative 1 to 1. Again, visually, we can pretty miserably see that it fails the horizontal line test. So it currently does not have an inverse. So we're going to restrict the domain. And the restriction of the domain that a long time ago mathematicians decided on was 0 to pi. Now we could have chosen like negative pi to 0, but that is not what they chose. And again, we have to do the closed bracket 
because at zero and at pi, it's negative one and one, and we need the entire range. So when we take the inverse, now the domain will be negative one to one, and the range will be zero to infinity. And as we discussed previously, you're gonna input an, a ratio, and you're gonna output an angle. And that angle will specifically be only from zero to pi. I'm gonna repeat this one more time. When you're evaluating regular cosine, you do not think about the restriction of the domain. You only think about the restricted domain when you are dealing with the inverse, which it becomes the range. So if we take a look at our unit circle, here's zero, here's pi over two, here's pi, and then the angles in the quadrant that we know how to evaluate without a calculator. So when we go backwards, I can only ask you the ones that we know how to evaluate without a calculator. This will be pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, two pi over three, three pi over four, and five pi over six. So when you're answering cosine inverse, depending on what ratio you're putting in, your answer will either be 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 6, or pi. Those are the only options. All right, let's do tangent. So the original domain of tangent is all real numbers except odd multiples of pi over 2. And at odd, odd multiples of pi over 2, it has vertical asymptotes, which we can see in the graph. The range of tangent is all real. Also, again, we can visually see that. And we can also visually see that it fails the horizontal line test. So the restriction that we create for tangent is right in between these two asymptotes, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now, the way that you write it is a little bit different than sine because you have to use open parentheses on the negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. There are asymptotes there. They don't exist for that function. So they can't be included in the domain. They weren't included in the original domain. They definitely cannot be included when you restrict the domain because the restricted domain is part of the original domain. So now we can create the inverse. So we're going to switch it. So the domain is all real. So you can plug in anything into tangent inverse. And the range is specifically negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So the diagram here looks very similar. This is pi over two. This is negative pi over two. This is zero. We have our three angles in quadrant one. We have our three angles in quadrant four. It's pi over six. Ooh, I did that in one go. <laughs> pi over four, pi over three, negative pi over six, negative pi over four, negative pi over three. So tangent is also quadrants one and four. And cosine is quadrant one and two. And of course, sine was the first one we did, which was quadrant one and quadrant four. So in the next video, we are going to actually evaluate the inverse.